Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you, and it's an honor uh, to be here at Rutgers. Uh, I have a very, very, very long history uh, at Rutgers. My mom was the associate dean of the Graduate School of uh, Applied and Professional Psychology. My sister went here. My brother went here. My son is a senior here. Um, when I got rejected at every one of my undergraduate selections, um, which is true, University College uh, accepted me here at night school, um, where I took my first philosophy uh, course and was inspired. Um, and um, as was mentioned, I was on the Board of Trustees and then the Board of Governors, where I had the chance to work very closely with uh, President Barchi uh, as the uh, finance, finance chair, committee chair, on a number of difficult things that we went through at that time, a lot of transitions and uh, a lot of hard work. Um, and it was uh, some of the best board uh, work and some of the closest relationships that I formed. So uh, I'm really uh, honored to be here and grateful to be here. And then I got rejected from all of the graduate schools I applied to for business as well, and which is why I went to Stern, because I went there at night as well. There, see, I wanted to go full-time, but nobody accepted me. So um, you might be saying to yourselves, like, because it's kind of a mystery to me, it must be a mystery to you, like, why am I in front of you uh, talking when uh, you've all rejected me so many times? But uh, I love you anyway, and it's good. It's good to be here. It's healthy for me, uh, psychologically, I think. Um, in some way, um, but I do want to I do want to talk a little bit about um, uh, and reinforce maybe some of the things that uh, Professor Barchi uh, said because I do believe that we are in an era of unprecedented change right now. Um, and I'll say the provocative statement that even with all the changes uh, that we're making. Um, that I think we need to as a uh, uh, both undergraduate and graduate academic programs think very hard about what we are teaching and uh, who we are putting out into the marketplace. Because, um, again, if we're teaching accountants or coders or um, lawyers, I do believe we do a good job at giving them those skill sets. But I do think if you look at the leaders of companies uh, around our country and around the globe, and I've had a chance to meet with most of them, um, they're struggling. They're struggling uh, right now with all the change uh, that's going on. Um, somebody up here talked about uh, the length of, uh, of a company's uh, lifespan on the S&P 500. In the 1930s, it was 75 years. I think McKinsey just came out with a study uh, that last year, it's now 12 years. Um, and so companies are having a harder and harder time surviving in all of the change. That's not new. If you go back 100 years ago and look at the Fortune 500 companies, the largest companies in America 100 years ago, 98% of them are out of business today. If you go back 50 years and look at the Fortune 100, Fortune 100, these were the companies that had it all. Every resource you can imagine, towering skyscrapers as their headquarters, large uh, suburban campuses, uh, money, resource. Fortune 100, about 85% of them are out of business uh, today. And if you fast forward into the tech era and you look at the early internet leaders, you know, Prodigy, CompuServe, AOL, all out of business. You look at the early search leaders, Excite, Lycos, AltaVisa, Go, uh, At Home, Netscape, all out of business. The earliest PC leaders, Tandy, Commodore, IBM, all out of, out of business or out of those businesses. And it goes on and on. And we live in a time where the definitions of how we think about things are changing dramatically. 
It's no longer possible as a business leader to extrapolate from what was, try to be ever more efficient, and evolve your company. It is, linear thinking will not work in the world uh, that we exist in. If we're teaching students formulas and equations and ways of extrapolating and ways of becoming, looking at productivity and how to improve efficiency, I think we are actually squeezing out the actual attributes that students need right now, which is creativity and uh, a different way of looking at the world and constantly examining whether or not the direction that we're going in makes sense given all the change in the world. I will say, um, being part of uh, Silicon Valley, um, you can't help but notice all the change that's going on right now. Um, you know, the, the concept of distribution is fundamentally changed right now. You have five to six billion mobile phones out in the world right now. Call about three billion of them smartphones. I'm on the board of directors of a company called Flex. It's a big contract manufacturer uh, company. Um, we do most of the mobile phones around the world. You now can get a smartphone um, in India for under $25. Uh, the price of that is dropping. Really, that smartphone now has more power in it than a 1980 craze supercomputer uh, had in it, and that's for under $25 right now. Connectivity is exploding around the world. Think about a world where you've got every citizen with a mobile phone, probably a smartphone, good connectivity at a very low cost on that. The adjacencies around that, like storage, Storage has gone down in the last 10 years 650 times in terms of its cost reduction. What used to cost like $4 costs now one-tenth of one-tenth of a cent for that same amount of storage. It is staggering what's happening on the technology front. The great, the great story that I love to say is if the automobile industry had kept pace with Moore's Law, the cost of a, of a Lexus today would be $1, right? It would go the speed of sound. It would get 600 miles to a thimble full of gasoline. And what makes the entire argument moot is that it would also be the size of a postage stamp. Um, <laughs> but there's no question that things are you know, changing very quickly on both the tech uh, hardware side, more powerful, less cost. And on the communication side, more speed, less cost. And you have full connectivity around uh, distribution. It now takes what used to take decades to reach 50 million people. So when radio was introduced, it took 75 years to get to 50 million people. And then the internet came around and it took um, I think it took 12 years to get to 50 million. Um, you've got um, uh, each technology less and less. When Apple put out their first phone, it took them two quarters to get to 50 million subscribers. So the pace of scale is changing dramatically from decades to years to quarters right now because you have built-in distribution models that change everything. And the cost to get there is so small, it's so small. You basically do everything through server farms and the cloud and you really don't have to invest a lot. And it makes a, makes a real big difference in terms of how rapidly people can introduce new business models at scale to affect each company and that are radically different. So from all of those devices and from all that connectivity, there's a huge amount of what we call data exhaust that comes out. Not data exhaustion, data exhaust. Data that spit out from all of that. Facebook today has the equivalent of 126 digital books on every single subscriber. Think about a digital book is about 150 pages worth of information. They have 126 books 
digital books of information on each of you. They know you better than you admit that you know yourself. They know who your real friends are. They know what you like. They know what your political affiliations are. Um, they know all of the intimate things about you. They know if you think you're sick, whether you are sick. Um, and um, they know every single thing about you. If you think about the interactions with Facebook, there are about 30 billion interactions with Facebook every day. Google gets six billion searches every single day. Twitter has 500 million tweets a day, most by our president, um, but uh, no, that's not true, that's not true. Don't record that. Um, so, um, and then, how many of you have heard of an app called Tinder? Tinder, how many? Raise your hand. Aha, this is quite a group. Uh, those who didn't raise your hand, I know, are the big users of it. Um, so, <laughs> anyway, for those of you who don't, you know, it's a uh, it's the best way of saying it. It's like a uh, dating kind of app. Um, really, a little bit uh, short dating app um, would be the best way of doing it. And the way you uh, like somebody or not like somebody is you swipe left or right on it. So Tinder, this will say something about our society today, Tinder has 1.4 billion swipes a day. 1.4 billion swipes a day um, is what's going on. So um, emails, anybody have any clue how many emails are sent every day? Uh, not every day, a year. We have 81 trillion emails sent every year. 81 trillion emails sent. So you've got a huge data exhaust going on right now. And that data exhaust is really what AI is all about trying to do uh, right now. Um, the problem with all that data is very hard to analyze it. It's overwhelming. It's hard to make use of it. But AI promises to take and, uh, and put that data into uh, uses and information. That's, that can be very scary for a lot of people because remember, Facebook knows you better than you know yourself. Google probably knows you better than you know yourself. And uh, there's a ton of data and information. And the weapon of this next era of companies is algorithms. And al if algori algorithms are the weapon the ammunition of an algorithm is data. The more data you have, the higher quality that data, the more accurate your algorithms are. And so scale and data are really important. And if you throw in on top of that cybersecurity as a giant risk, just to give you a quick, I'm also chairman of the board of Symantec, which is the largest cybersecurity software company in the world. Um, the consumer identity is stolen every two seconds. Every quarter, 750 million new websites are put up on the web, of which 74% are there for less than 24 hours before they can become categorized, really all containing malware or spear phishing attacks to try and and trap you in some way, shape, form, or another. Over 400 million pieces of malware introduced last year. Um, and uh, we have a saying in the cybersecurity business that uh, there are two types of companies, those who have been hacked and those who do not know they've been hacked. Um, and, um, and the average American business gets, uh, the average American business gets attacked four million times a year. The average financial institution, like a PayPal, we get attacked over a billion times a year, over a billion times a year. So you throw cybersecurity on top of that, you throw all the privacy issues uh, that are at the forefront, you throw the anxiety uh, that's coming up uh, from society right now around robotics, around driverless cars, um, around AI and what that can do. Um, and uh, it's no wonder um, that a lot of people are uptight 
uh, about what's going to happen. President Barchi made a great point about, um, um, I forget what your stat was, like 50% of people don't are training now for a job that they won't have 10 years from now. I think that's probably an underestimation of what's going on. One sector after another is being upended. It's like, Think about the internet as sort of a digital tornado. When it touches down into an industry, it sucks it up, it spits it out, new business models land, new companies land, and they're redefined. Whether that's the entertainment industry, whether that's the trucking industry, whether that's the retail industry, because think about driverless cars, they're gonna to totally redefine retail, they're gonna redefine insurance, um, uh, financial services, there's probably gonna be more change in financial services in the next five years than have occurred in the past 30. Retail is under a fundamental secular trend and shift right now. There are 1,200 enclosed malls in the US. A third of them are dead or dying uh, right now. You look at retail sector left and right on average over the last 10 years, its market cap is down by 40%. In that same 10 years, Amazon's market cap is up by 2,400%. There is one retailer after another going out of business. They have to totally redefine their business models. It's based on mobile, and it's blurring the distinction between online and offline. It's algorithms that are dri driving that. You go to a store in China, there are no shopping carts anymore. You just go, you tap, you scan, it's delivered to your house. It's seamless between online and offline. In the retail industry, Amazon buying Whole Foods was like Pearl Harbor in World War II. It's like you knew it was happening, but you always thought online and offline were separate. They aren't anymore. Online and offline are coming together in a seamless experience, and it will rede redefine retail and the jobs uh, that are there. So I look across society right now and I see fundamental change going on and a lot of anxiety that's going on. And we as leaders need to think about that in very expansive ways. First of all, you cannot drive the boat steering by the wake anymore. There is no way you can be a leader of a company and look backwards Look at the wake of the boat and say, stay within that wake. That does not work anymore. And if we are not teaching students to think in a nonlinear fashion, we are setting them up, setting them up to be unsuccessful. You know, in many ways, I've learned more about leadership from martial arts than I have from my formal education. I've gone through a lot of formal education, even though I didn't get in it and, and, and anywhere. I, I still persisted and got a lot of formal education. Um, and, you know, here are the things I learned in martial arts. Like, the best way to win a fight is not to get into a fight. It's an interesting way of thinking about the world and challenging yourself and thinking about co-opetition and cooperation. Um, because models are changing fundamentally. No one company can do it alone. Platform companies need to be open. They need to think about their, their architecture, their models in different ways. Second thing I learned in martial arts is, I, I do this Israeli weird kind of uh, martial arts, and uh, one of their big things is every bullet has a home, which basically means do not waste your time just firing indiscriminately. You need to have a game plan that you're going in and you need to put your resources against fewer things than more things. The next thing that they say is, if you're gonna get into a fight, expect to be hit. I think most people plan for perfection and changing business models, being in, it's a messy business. It is a messy business. And if you think you're gonna be like teaching people like this is going to work if you do this and it isn't. In fact, somehow you gotta make them fail and make them fail a lot in what they're doing so that they understand that innovation is a two-edged sword. Everybody talks about innovation, but the flip side of innovation is you fail a ton. 
That's what happens all the time in the valley. We constantly do A-B testing, constantly. Somebody loses every single day in our company. Actually, they lose 1,000 times a day in our company because we do about 1,000 releases a day, software releases a day in our company. We do over 40,000 software releases in a quarter in our company. It is constant, constant looking. And then, finally, no matter what, in fighting, you never stand still. Whether you're winning or losing, you never stand still because standing still is asking to be hit. So those things I think about a lot when I lead uh, at PayPal. Let's say one other thing, and then I'm going to stop and maybe open it up for any questions if I have any time. No, nah, I'm not going to have any time. That's good. I didn't really want questions. Um, so one other thing that leaders now, there's no way of escaping our moral obligation as leaders of companies to engage in the political and the cultural landscape that's happening right now. There's no way out of it at all. Um, if you're going to be a great company, you actually have to have a vision and a mission that attracts great people. It's got to be meaningful. It's got to actually make a difference somewhere in the world. And you have to have values that reflect that. But if you have values and you don't act on them, then they're just words on a wall. They're just words on a wall. And let me give you an example because it actually is not easy to be a part of the political system or the cultural wars that are going on. At PayPal, our, our mission is democratizing financial services. And democratizing financial services is basically saying that we believe that managing and moving money is a right for every citizen and not a privilege for the affluent. It's a very inclusive uh, statement and vision. And so obviously, one of our big values is inclusion as a company. When North Carolina passed its HB2 uh, bill, which uh, allowed for the discrimination um, against uh, peoples for their sexual orientation or sexual identity. Um, we had just announced with the governor two weeks before that we were going to build a, uh, a big center in Charlottesville. Um, and um, we we're going to put 400 to 600 people in there, generate about $200 million for the economy in North Carolina. And Franz and I, um, I was watching the governor uh, talk on TV, and he basically said a lot of businesses, I had signed a petition against it right away, and um, so did a number of my uh, colleagues, uh, CEO colleagues. And um, he basically said on TV, businesses are talking a lot, but they're not taking action. I think we're gonna be fine on this bill. So we announced that we were going to pull out of North Carolina, that we were not going to go ahead uh, with our center. Uh, it became national news. The Department of Justice noticed it, uh, took up that case. Because I'm from New Jersey, my, it was lonely for a while there until Bruce Springsteen came in, canceled uh, his uh, uh, tour. Then the NBA uh, came in. Um, I spoke with... Uh, CEO of uh, Deutsche Bank, they also uh, decided not to add more people. And that bill um, became a cost celeb around the world. Um, of course, with that, I got multiple personal threats, um, death threats, um, things that uh, you would never want to see, um, ever. Uh, and uh, I accidentally told my mom about it. Um, which never tell your mom about a death threat. That's sort of a, because they, they don't like that. And she said, would you do it again? And I told her we would do that 100 times out of 100 times because that's what we stand for. Like, you have to make a stand and businesses need to be, and I think we have a moral obligation to be a force for good. We can no longer turn to governments um, to solve all the ills of the world. We need to partner with them. We need to be at the forefront of, uh, of leading the charge. And a lot of people say, well, why aren't you just profit maximizing right now? And uh, you know, are you, why are you being an activist CEO, which I'm referred to as? And I, I just say, I'm not being an activist CEO, I'm being a responsible CEO. 
I'm being a responsible citizen. Maybe I wasn't elected, but I also cast votes, and the 18,000 employees of PayPal cast votes, and we have a right to live up to the values that we have. By the way, it's not always easy. Like when Charlottesville happened and we uh, have an acceptable user, user policy that no site shall accept PayPal that promotes hatred, violence, or racial intolerance. So you'd think it'd be easy to shut down Nazi sites or KKK sites um, without too much um, uh, blowback on that, but it's not. You get a ton, a ton of, um, of pushback. Um, even, and we take it very, very seriously. We have a team of people that pour through any questionable website, and we don't always agree with um, a lot of companies that we have a lot in common with from a value perspective, like Southern Poverty Law Center uh, and others. We research every single thing to try and make that delineation between freedom of speech and hate. And it's hard, it's hard. Um, and, um, and we try our best to get it right. And you might say, well, what makes us an arbiter of that? Well, we have to figure out what we support and what we don't as a company. Um, and, um, and we work hard at it every single day. But those cultural wars are out there. Um, the day that I had dinner with the President of the United States, not President Barczyk, um, I was on CNN denouncing the immigration bill. It was a very uncomfortable dinner. Um, uh, but it, I felt the, that was unconstitutional. Um, and so I think what I'm saying about uh, being a CEO and being a leader and what we're trying to develop um, from all of you coming into this as leaders of uh, the next generation of our country and around the world um, is we need to think about the skill sets that those leaders need. They're very, very different than what they were before. The pace of change is extraordinary. The pressures on you are extraordinary. You still have quarterly earnings. You still have all those things that go on. I'm talking about things that go way beyond that, way beyond that. It is the ability to challenge your business models, to redefine what your mission is, and to uh, be a leader in a national uh, environment because you have to fight back against nationalism, against restriction of trade against a number of things that are important, I think, to our world. And I just would end by saying I travel around the world. And uh, I just got back from China. I was walking on the Bund, uh, which is uh, in Shanghai, right on the water. And um, I was walking along there, and there were kids taking selfies and goofing around and parents with their arms around their kids and trying to take pictures together. And it struck me, it struck me how similar, how similar that same scene would have been walking down, you know, on the West Side Highway uh, in the Hudson. I think we have more in common than, uh, um, and share a lot of values across the world. Um, and I think ways of bringing us together Making technology a driving force for inclusion and benefit is something that we all need to work hard on and figure out how we do so that it doesn't become this divisive force and then we can use it um, in ways that we can all be proud of. So anyway, um, thank you for your time. I appreciate it and I uh, wish you the best of luck in the rest of the conference. Thank you.